everybody. Um, thank you for tuning into our webinar Wednesday today. We are talking about respiratory health in the workplace um, uh, in terms of specifically cannabis production and processing. Um, I am welcoming here today uh, Dr. Christopher Simpson. Um, he is a uh, researcher with the University of Washington um, in the Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences. Uh, Dr. Simpson has been working on looking at worker safety um, for a while now, and um, I would love for you, Dr. Simpson, to do a little bit more of an introduction about yourself. I'm sort of curious how you ended up in this particular field of inquiry, um, and then specifically cannabis in particular. Sure. Well, thanks uh, so much for the introduction, Caitlin, and uh, th thanks for the opportunity to talk a little bit about the work that I do and um, uh, and the important topic of, of occupational health and safety for, for cannabis workers. So uh, by way of uh, introduction, uh, my, my training is actually um, in environmental and analytical chemistry. Um, and for about 25 years or so, I've been applying that skill set to um, to measure um, exposures that, that both workers and community members uh, receive to, to hazardous chemicals, uh, trying to quantify those exposures, trying to relate those exposures uh, to health outcomes, and importantly, trying to control those exposures where appropriate in order to, um, to uh, protect the health of, of workers and, and community members. Uh, so, so you asked how it was that that um, I got into the the cannabis space. So, the the department that I work for here at the University of Washington, um, the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences, we actually receive funding from uh, the state legislature uh, to uh, to train health and safety professionals um, and to help protect the the health of the workers in, in Washington State. Um, so, we do that. Uh, by um, by training uh, people in occupational health and safety, by conducting uh, research uh, to understand the hazards that workers are exposed to in the state, um, and and also by providing continuing education to um, to workers and employers themselves. So uh, when when Washington uh, voters uh, voted to legalize adult use of, of cannabis uh, back in uh, 2012, I think I think the vote was, and maybe 2014 was was when uh, the the adult use uh, industry hit the ground. Um, we we recognized that um, uh, there were there was the potential to be um, new exposures in this particular industry. Uh, was, it, it's very rare that um, a, a new industry comes online. Um, and we felt that, um, that due to the fact we're receiving money from the state to protect workers, that we kind of had a responsibility to get together with employers and, um, and try and understand the, the hazards that their, um, the, their workforce might encounter. Uh, Cannabis is um, uh, is in many ways similar to, to other agricultural and horticultural crops. And so we guessed that the same kinds of exposures and workplace hazards that uh, you might encounter in a in horticulture, in a nursery, um, or in other forms of, of outdoor agriculture, that those same uh, risks would be present for, for cannabis workers. Um, but we also uh, recognize that there may be exposures that were unique to either dealing with the cannabis plant or to the, the particular processes that are involved in processing um, in the cannabis plant to, to make and use products. Uh, so that was uh, th that was what inspired us to um, to get together, uh, partner with with um, the cannabis industry in, in Washington State, and and really try and work with with the industry, um, and and try and understand the exposures that um, the workers might be facing. Fantastic. So I'm um, I I gotta ask. Um, 
how did the University of Washington uh, respond when you said you wanted to study cannabis? Because, and while it is accurate to say a new industry online in terms of a re new regulated industry, it's certainly not a new industry, right? People have been doing this activity for a very, very long time. Um, but being unright, you know, that it, it creates a different, uh, I have so many follow-up questions about all that, but the first one we'll stick with. Um, how did how did the university feel uh, or respond when you said that I think the cannabis industry is also now our responsibility? Yeah, so uh, so at the level of, of my department, uh, there was there was very strong support. In fact, the, the department, I sat down with the, the department chair and, and he says, absolutely, it's our responsibility to be doing this. If not us, who else is going to do it? So, so he was squarely in support of um, of launching uh, those kinds of research activities. Uh, at higher levels of the the university administration, I would say that there was support too, but um, um, but they were also uh, constrained by the the federal. Uh, um, prohibition on on a lot of uh, on 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 cannabis uh, in, in many aspects, um, and the way it applies to, to universities is that um, uh, universities are, are prohibited on, on doing a lot of research with cannabis uh, because doing so would put their funding at risk. So at the um, at the upper levels of administration, um, they they were. Yeah, we're we're supportive of what you want to do, but there's there's some pretty clear barriers in terms of what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. So um, uh, it's it's totally um, okay for me to to make measurements of exposures in workplaces. I'm totally fine to conduct interviews with workers, um, uh, have them complete questionnaires, and 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 that co that kind of thing. The bright line is that um, I'm not allowed to work with with the cannabis plant itself, so I can't bring cannabis materials on site here at the University of Washington. I can't, um, I couldn't do studies that involve uh, giving cannabis to workers and 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 um, measuring uh, the effects of of cannabis use on. Um, on aspects of their performance in the in the workplace or on aspects of their health, for example. So I'm kind of curious. You just brought up um, cannabis as aspects uh, they're impacting how they are at work. So I'm kind of curious. Was there ever an interest in looking at folks who had cannabis in their system and their ability to perform their job? Is am I understanding that, or is that? Uh, so that so that is certainly something that that is of interest uh, both in Washington State and and nationwide. Um, there's some 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 folks uh, concerned that um, similar to to use of alcohol, for example, that if a worker was um, was using cannabis and 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 maybe. Um, impaired even to a um, to a, a small amount due to the fact that they have cannabis in their system that that might impact their their job performance and and most importantly impact uh, safety on the on the on the job and so you might be work concerned if a worker was uh, had a had a job where they were driving a forklift and or something like that and and um, and they were impaired so that that is uh, one area that that um, the occupational health field has uh, has some concerns about. That's not that, to be clear. That is not a, an area that my own research has focused on. Uh, but but kind of um, sort of in parallel to that, there uh, there's recognition that that cannabis could actually be beneficial to workers. Uh, so so we have had a um, a big problem as far as um, op uh, opiate addiction. Um, so, so workers that, that might get chronic back injuries, for example, then get prescribed opiates and become addicted to those opiates. Um, and that, that, is, that is a problem for workers across the United States as well. And so the, uh, there is the, the suggestion that, well, if you, if you were able to prescribe cannabis to, to workers rather than opiates, uh, that might manage that allow them to manage their um, their chronic pain, um, 
without becoming addicted as, as has been the, the case with opiates. And unfortunately, it's exactly that kind of research that, um, that we're not allowed to do at the University of Washington, um, or at least not in a, uh, in a controlled sense, because we're not allowed to prescribe uh, cannabis to, to workers. We couldn't do the, the, um, um, the, the controlled study where you would uh, have one group of workers that were using opiates and a second group of, of workers that were using cannabis and, and um, then kind of evaluate the long-term health outcomes for those two groups. And that one answer, you came up with 17 different studies that I would love to have done <laughs> with folks. And to your point, just a couple of years ago, Washington passed a law preventing the ability for employers to screen in the hiring process, uh, whether or not somebody used cannabis. However, um, cannabis screening is still fairly commonplace, um, not just in jobs, though, where people are operating heavy machinery. Um, I think that that's a reasonable concern, um, especially without hardly any decent research out there around impairment in cannabis. Um, but then quite a few jobs, a lot of hospitals, um, a lot of other governmental jobs that really, um, for those of us who are around, in particular, a lot of cannabis patients who utilize cannabis therapeutically, have cannabis in their systems most of the day, all day, don't experience the, the type of impairment that perhaps somebody who is just using it occasionally would for the same volume of cannabis. Um, we just know that cannabis works in the body very differently than alcohol and continuing to make that one-to-one -one sort of per se analogy is really unhelpful and, and not particularly useful. And then in addition to that, everything that you just brought up up around opioid use, um, we're hoping to move some uh, legislation forward on funding for a little bit more research, in particular around cannabis as a mitigating factor for opioid use. There are some very promising studies, um, preliminary studies that are coming out um, about how powerful cannabis can actually be as an off-ramp for people who are struggling with addiction. And, and like you said, a lot of people who are in that struggle started with a prescription first. This isn't sort of the old uh, D.A.R.E. program scenario where somebody on the street opened a trench coat and now, you know, but but like this is, a, a, is happening through a regular course of somebody living their life and then um and then they find that they're in trouble and i think that's a big part of the the struggle there um so thanks for speaking on that a little bit i gosh i really hope that there is a time here soon and we'll talk a little bit about that where the university can do some of that kind of research perhaps um as the federal government is moving forward on the schedule three that there might be some opportunity to uh loosen those those reins a little bit. Um, I'm going to jump around. We I sent you a list of questions. I'm going to jump around a little bit because I think it's pertinent to what we're discussing right now in this immediate moment. And that has to do with um, federal funding. So while there is that bright line, you know, a, a lot of research institutions that receive federal funding maintain that same sort of like, we can't give anybody cannabis. Um, you've received some federal funding to to work on your research. How, what was that process like? Um, uh, particularly around cannabis, did you have to jump through any additional hoops or pretty much as long as you were following those same rules, it was, that was okay. Um, I'd love to hear more about that process. Yeah. And that's, that's, uh, um, so the funding that we received is from the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, um, abbreviated as NIOSH, and they're, they're part of the, uh, the Federal Centers for Disease Control. And it's, it's actually been a, a kind of a long conversation with them beginning kind of back in, in um, 2014 or 2016 or so. Um, internally, NIOSH has a, so, so NIOSH is responsible for conducting uh, research to understand hazards faced by workers across the United States. Um, and they uh, they also make grants to researchers at, at universities uh, to conduct that occupational health and safety research. Uh, so back in around 2014 or so, um, uh, NIOSH has a has an internal program whereby um, if if workers reach out to them and say, "Hey, we think we have a problem in our in our particular workplace." Um, then NIOSH is, um, is, uh, has a program where they will go out to, to workplaces and, uh, 
and assess exposures in, the, in that workplace and try and help the employers to, to control the exposures that were taking place. Um, that, that program is called the Health Hazard Evaluation Program. And NIOSH has now been out to, I think, at least three different cannabis facilities under the auspices of that program. Um, because they were uh, they were invited either by the employers or by um, worker unions and um, and and NIOSH charter uh, requires that they they have to have to respond to those kinds of requests. So NIOSH has been in this this odd position that are, on the one hand uh, they recognize that that cannabis workers are workers too and they have a responsibility to protect those workers. And on the other hand, they're part of the federal government that says you're not allowed to, to have anything to do with, with cannabis. Uh, so um, fast forward to around about 2020, it was. Um, and uh, at that point, the, um, the grant makers at NIOSH uh, said, you know, if you go ahead and, and send us a grant application describing the kind of work that you're doing, um, we will we will review and consider that application alongside uh, the other applications for for research that um, that we're receiving. Um, and so they um, it wasn't it's not something that I would say was a funding priority for them, uh, but they had moved to a level of comfort that um, that they said if, um, if 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 you submit a a quality proposal for for doing work in this area, we will consider that. Um, alongside any, all of the other uh, proposals that that we received, um, and and so we we got that project funded as part of the uh, Pacific Northwest Center for Agricultural Safety and Health Research that is based here at the University of Washington, uh, and that's a a five year project that um, aims to uh, understand the um, the respiratory exposures that are experienced by uh, cannabis um, uh, growers and cannabis pr um, uh, processes and um, uh, attempt to understand any associations between those exposures and health outcomes, health, health uh, so, such as respiratory symptoms, um, uh, airway disease, uh, so, and in some cases, the, the suggestion of occupational asthma. And then most importantly, uh, to the extent that we identify that there are specific exposures that are associated with those health effects, help the employers to put in exposure controls so that the, the workers are appropriately protected and are able to continue doing, uh, doing their jobs, but doing it safely. Fantastic. So um, that's encouraging to know that they actually came to that that level of comfort and conclusion of their own and, and reached out. Um, I am sort of curious. So I know that the by the time you were talking about the federal grant, you had already done some research and work with a few cannabis farms here. Um, how did you land on respiratory health to begin with? Was that out of that process of just sort of assessing similar agricultural practices and feeling like that might be the area of greatest concern, or did you even start more basic than that? Um, and, and so, yeah, great question. So we uh, we really started by talking to the, the workers and the employers. We actually got funding from the state of Washington to do a study of uh, ultraviolet light exposure in, in uh, cannabis farms, because at that time there was... Um, uh, a potential concern that um, workers might be receiving high levels of, of UV exposure from the, the metal halide lamps and the, the uh, high intensity discharge sodium lamps that are used in indoor grows. Um, it turned out that in general, that was not a, um, a very high risk for, for um, unhealthy exposures, but as part of that project, um, we went around and we interviewed cannabis uh, workers and cannabis employers and asked them what uh, what safety concerns uh, they felt, uh, what 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 things they figured might be the biggest biggest hazards that uh, they dealt with um, uh, in, in their day to day jobs. 
and what we heard was uh, was respiratory exposures and respiratory health was the thing that they were most concerned about. We, and we heard anecdotal um, examples of of uh, people that would have um, incidents where uh, where they would have difficulty breathing due to um, exposures that they might experience in that in the workplace. Or, or just general uh, respiratory irritation, coughing, uh, irritated nose, running, watery eyes, those those kinds of symptoms. And so it was that that led us to um, to focus more specifically on um, what what the prevalence of those respiratory symptoms uh, were, and uh, and to try and understand uh, what kind of work tasks. Uh, might be associated with those symptoms and and what exposures that the workers might be experiencing that were associated with those symptoms. Got it. Um, and then so kind of answers my question about, so then beginning with that, I believe you had the smaller studies and then that continued to grow. And, um, and is that then sort of just organically then what has developed into this current study that you're working on? Um, yeah, so the um, the we the pilot study or the initial study uh, looking at respiratory health that we did that was at uh, two indoor grows here in, in Washington State. Um, it involved a total of about twenty workers, so it's a um, a, a pretty small sample size, but um, that's that's kind of typical when one is starting out uh, trying to trying to get a handle on on um, on a potential, um, a potential issue to, to, to take a look at. Uh, and what we found was um, a relatively high prevalence of, um, of respiratory symptoms amongst those 20 workers. And, and those symptoms were defined as things like, like I mentioned, um, cough, watery eyes, runny nose. And we asked the workers, um, did you experience those symptoms at work? Um, do they get worse? Oh, oh, sorry. Do they get better when you're away from work? So during across a weekend, for example. Um, and are there specific activities or specific exposures at work that seem to to exacerbate those symptoms? Um, and we used that set of questions because we really wanted to try and home in on whether the symptoms were. Um, occurring at work or being exacerbated by work to try and differentiate them from um, from symptoms that might be caused by um, seasonal allergies or, or, or things like that. Mm -hmm. Like I say, I think we saw somewhere on the order of 50 to 60 percent of the, um, the workers that we studied reported those uh, one or more of those work related symptoms. Uh, we also did measurements of uh, lung function and airway inflammation, um, and we found, uh, and, and in those cases, we were comparing uh, the, the lung function and, and uh, airway inflammation to population normal values across the United States. And so what we found was that um, a a significant proportion of the workers, somewhere on the order of 30% of or so, um, demonstrated impaired lung function or um, elevated uh, airway inflammation. Uh, the other thing that, that we were able to do uh, was to um, do some skin prick tests to try and test for, for cannabis allergy. And I have to caveat this by saying that, so uh, if, if you thought you had an allergy to, to something, you could go into an allergist and for, for most common allergens, they would have a little vial, standardized vial on the shelf that they would take off the shelf. They would do a little skin prick test with that vial. And if, if you had a, um, a red swelling around where that skin prick was done, that would be the, the diagnosis that you were allergic to that um, particular exposure. Uh, because of the, the federal restrictions on cannabis research, you, you cannot purchase a, a, a cannabis allergen for, for that kind of, of testing. And so we had to use um, extracts that we made ourselves from, from hemp. 
Um, but we found that something like 30% or so of the, um, between 20 to 30% of the workers that uh, we studied um, had a positive response to, uh, to the skin prick test with, with hemp. And so that, uh, that together with other information that um, has emerged in the scientific literature indicates that, um, that at least a certain portion of uh, people that are exposed to cannabis, including cannabis workers, can develop a, an allergic type response uh, to, to cannabis. And that, that probably is no great surprise. Uh, it has been known for, for a long time that um, workers exposed to, to hemp or workers exposed to hop, which is a, a biologically similar um, plant, uh, both of those workers, a, 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 a small proportion of them can develop allergies to, to hemp and, and to hops as well. I guess I don't, we've had this conversation several times, but I guess I don't think I understood that, yeah, that hops and cannabis, that if you've got one, I'm hearing you say you might have the other allergy, possibly, um, or well, that. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm not sure that I could make that statement specifically. Uh, it was more the, um, the hops uh, in terms of, of, of uh, kind of that, the biological ontology. Hops and um, hemp and cannabis are all um, closely related plants. Mm -hmm. and, and so if there is, um, it's plausible that if, if there is a protein or an allergen that's present in the hop plant, because hemp and cannabis are, are biologically very similar to, to hops, it would not be surprising to find that a similar protein or a similar allergen exists in uh, in the hop plant and the, uh, sorry, in the, uh, in the, in the hemp and the cannabis plants. Fantastic. Um, I love asking questions like that to scientists who are, thank you for being very specific <laughs> and checking my understanding there. Um, along those lines, I am, uh, curious about, um, because you brought up having to create your own sample. Um, we've talked about a couple of the um, other challenges around sort of the, the federal government. Um, one thing that I did want to ask you, as you started going into places and talking to employers and employees, um, were you finding that that folks were intuitively already putting protective measures in? Um, or was it kind of all over the map? I um, just because it sounds like there was just sort of some self, um, that folks were intuitively noticing that there might be some challenges there, um, with maybe the particulates in the air. Um, or did you find that, that folks were by and large trimming without masks and, um, maybe unsure that they were being impacted? Yeah, I, I think we saw, um, we saw quite a variety amongst the, the different workplaces that, that we went to. For the respiratory health study, like uh, we only did that in two workplaces, but for the the UV study, we, we went into a half a dozen different workplaces. And so we, we got to see the um how the the work processes were um were being undertaken in those facilities. And that included a, a range from um, from really small indoor uh, grows to um, to greenhouse grows and to some some larger outdoor grows, uh, and uh, and in some facilities they were um, they were very much uh, or they had they had observed uh, respiratory issues from amongst the workers and uh, and they were taking precautions uh, usually as far as the respiratory uh, respiratory protection was concerned um that was that was voluntary and so the the workers could choose to to wear a mask or not um in some cases the they were wearing um at least in some of the earlier facilities we went to they may be wearing bandanas uh which um uh, from a an occupational health point of view is Probably not very protective against um, against the kind of small particles that uh, that can enter your lungs and 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 do do damage. It may be protective against uh, really coarse um, uh, particles, but um, but not protective against the, the the really small particles. 
Um, and then we saw, saw other facilities where they might provide a um, like a, a, a full face respirator, one of those big plastic, uh, not plastic, uh, rubber elastomeric respirators um, and make that available for the workers to use. Uh, but we didn't really see uh, uh, any facilities that had what would be considered a um, uh, an OSHA compliant respirator program because that kind of program requires um, fit testing to make sure that the respirator appropriately fits the worker that's going to be using it, requires that the uh, worker undergoes a medical evaluation uh, to ensure that it's safe for them to, to wear a respirator because uh, wearing a respirator does increase the effort required to breathe and, and so on. In some cases, if, if someone's lung function is sufficiently impaired, it wouldn't be safe for them to actually wear a respirator. Um, and uh, and, and uh, then there's, there's uh, um, training that, that, that has to uh, go into the respirator program in terms of what is the appropriate respirator to use, when should it be used, how should it be cleaned, all of that, that kind of information. Uh, and so what we would see is employers trying to do the right thing by purchasing a respirator and making it available, but maybe not going all the way to, um, to, to what would be considered an OSHA compliant respiratory protection program. Got it. So um, to follow up with that, uh, I remember as you were gearing up the study, um, the there was an actual cannabis a death at at a facility i think it was michigan right um yeah uh, can you say more about that did that suddenly increase the urgency of continuing to do this research at all um has had did that in, impact the trajectory of your research uh so uh, so so that that was uh, certainly a very unfortunate uh, tragedy that that, that worker uh, lost their life at the, the Michigan facility. And it, I think it um, it didn't necessarily change the trajectory of the, the research project that we were doing, but I think it did highlight um, that this is a very important um, uh, exposure to try and understand and, and to try and, and try and control. Uh, the the uh, the federal OSHA investigation uh, uh, came to the determination or came to the conclusion that the the worker died as a result of their exposure to cannabis dust. Uh, the worker was um, their their specific job responsibilities included um, um, do, making the pre roll joints. Uh, so, so uh, they were a, a pre-rolled technician. They weren't specifically involved in the um, the grinding of the cannabis material, but they were involved in packing the ground material into those those pre-rolled joints. Uh, the um, the level the dust levels um, in cannabis facilities that we've measured and that others have measured uh, are not dramatically high they they certainly wouldn't um exceed the existing osha regulations for um for for uh, nuisance dust mm -hmm. um and yet um osha concluded that that uh, cannabis dust was an asthmogen um and that it was the exposure to the the cannabis dust that had caused this worker to to develop asthma and then to have a um subsequently to have a exacerbation of their their asthma that um that led to them losing their lives so um uh, that to some extent that um that increased awareness i think amongst the industry that um that even though there was not a clear regulation around cannabis dust per se, um, that at least the regulators uh, were considering cannabis dust to be a respiratory hazard, and, and therefore um, employers had to, um, had to inform their employees that, um, that cannabis dust uh, was, um, was hazardous, or at least was hazard, there was a potential hazard in the eyes of the regulator. Uh, that it could be uh, that it was associated with with respiratory disease, including uh, in some cases occupational asthma, 
um, and that the uh, that the employers had a responsibility to try and control the uh, the dust exposures that their workers were experiencing. Okay, and you bring up a really interesting uh, point. And that is, um, you know, in in some cases, uh, we've spoken to some licensees who are hesitant to bring somebody in um, looking at this. And uh, from our perspective, I want to say thank you for doing this research because there is such a stigma around cannabis. Uh, we find often that in the absence of good science around it, regulations um, and expectations are set based on how how. Um, sometimes policymakers feel about the cannabis plant and not so much on the actual science around what what would make people safe. What are the considerations that need to be put in place? Um, if this is a little bit different, if the dust is different here, why is it different and what can we do to, to best protect folks? Um, and, and then so a lot of times we find that that shows up in over-regulation or incorrect regulation um, that, that as a licensee or a business owner actually is more onerous than if we had just had good science <laughs> to go off of and ensuring actual safety, which I know everybody genuinely does want to do. Um, so thank you for doing this. Um, what do you think about what I just said? Uh, so so I, I absolutely agree. It is... Um where there is a potential health hazard, it is important to understand that health hazard as best we can so that we know how to intervene to control the exposures um, rather than, as as you say, uh, either um, ignoring the potential for, for a hazard until um, a tragedy happens or um, having regulations and uh, enforced on the industry that, that are not based on science and, and don't make any sense. Uh, certainly the worst thing that could happen would be for uh, the federal government to come in and say, hey, this industry is unsafe and we're going to shut it down uh, without, without any scientific basis for, for doing that. Um, my work is is uh, absolutely dependent on um, the the generosity and the willingness of workers and employers to part, partner with me. The employers to allow me uh, and my team to to come on site to to measure the exposures, um, and and uh, help me uh, allow me to help work with them to to try and uh, uh, implement. Um, effective interventions that that can reduce those exposures, um, and and uh, it's, my work is greatly uh, dependent on the the willingness of the employees to um, allow me to collect health information from them so that we can um, uh, associate uh, or, or try try and determine associations between specific exposures between specific activities and the health outcomes uh, so that we can then um, appropriately intervene on those specific activities that, that, that might be a hazard so that we can control the hazard. Fantastic. So with that, tell us about the study that you're working on. We are currently actively recruiting people to participate. Um, if somebody says, yes, I'm interested, uh, what can they expect uh, after you've made contact with them? Sure. So, <clears throat> um, so with this particular study, uh, we're we're looking to quantify the respiratory exposures that workers in uh, cannabis production and cannabis processing experience, and so that includes um, measuring the dust concentrations um, that the the workers are inhaling, and we do that with a um, a small pump and filter that the worker wears during their work shift. Uh, we've uh, we've also heard um, that possibly the the terpenes or some of the volatile components in cannabis uh, may be associated with some of these respiratory health effects, and so we're um, we're measuring those terpene exposures as well. Uh, you you would have heard me say that the uh, federal OSHA determined that that uh, cannabis dust was responsible for the death of the the worker in, in Michigan, uh, but it is fair to say that uh, we we really don't know 
Um, we don't know for absolute sure that that it, that cannabis dust is uh, is the thing or the only thing that is responsible for respiratory health effects in cannabis workers. Um, in some cases, there can be mold uh, that that uh, grows on that on the cannabis plant, and we know that um, that that um, mold can be an allergen and, and cause respiratory health effects as well. And so uh, we would be measuring for indicators of mold and fungi um, uh, in those air samples that we we collect, so that we can uh, try and um, identify is 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 it the cannabis plant is it mold and fungi um is it a combination of the two that that um that are the exposures that that we should be worried about uh we were we we want to recruit workers involved in a variety of different tasks uh again so that we can try and that helps us to try and understand where where the, the greatest risk might be. And so we're, we would be looking for workers that are involved in uh, um, tending to the, the, the green plants, so the nursery workers, uh, and, and workers that are um, involved in the, the harvesting, uh, the trimming, the, um, the production activities with, with the dried plant material. So, so uh, working with pre-roll and also um, workers that are in the industry but maybe don't have as direct contact with the, the plant itself so so um, office staff at these businesses um uh, sales staff things like that um so so that we can that we would um, have a range of different exposures that we're measuring um and and relating those to the, the health uh, outcomes that are reported by the workers in terms of the health measurement, um, so that the exposure measurement for each worker that signed up to participate in the study, uh, we would do our measurements on a, a Monday and a Friday. We do that because with um, with occupational um, allergic disease, uh, there are for for some allergens, there's a pattern where uh, the um, the symptoms get worse at the at the start uh, at, across the work week, resolve during the weekend when you're away from the exposure, um, and so when you come in on Monday morning, um, your lung function is much much healthier, and then it declines as as the exposure continues during the week. So that's that's the re reason for um, studying workers both on a Monday and on a Friday. In terms of that, the health measurements, we would have workers complete a respiratory symptom questionnaire. Um, we have a couple of small portable devices that we would use to measure uh, lung function, which is basically how how fast you can breathe out um, the volume of air that you can exhale from your lung. Um, we have a, another portable device that measures airway inflammation, again, just by uh, measuring a, a marker of airway inflammation in your exhaled breath. Um, we'll use a... a um, a sticky tape sample to collect uh, dead skin cells off of the skin, uh, which we can then analyze for um, proteins that that, um, uh, that are associated with immune, an immune response to, to cannabis specifically. Um, and we would also collect a, um, do a, a blood draw on the workers so that in the, uh, we can measure those immune function markers um, in the blood sample as well. So those those are the uh, the uh, the various measurements that we would be trying to to uh, make on the on the workers. Uh, obviously, in order to to do all that in a, in addition to getting um, workers who are, are willing to help out with the study, um, we we need um, employers that are willing to to have us come on site and uh, and make those 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 measurements. Uh, the uh, we we strive to um, to limit the impact on the on the workplace. Uh, so the the samples that are being collected, we would work ar around the 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 workers and the employers to make sure that we're not interfering with the, the workers' ability to, to do their work um, and not taking them away from their, their, uh, their regular work activities. 
and then the the workers that participate in the study receive a um, a small monetary compensation um, uh, to to compensate them for uh, the, the inconvenience of, um, of of the various uh, tests and so on that that we run. Wonderful. So um, we did get a question uh, in the chat and um, curiosity is what are the common respiratory symptoms experienced by those working with cannabis and hemp? Yeah, so um, the the most common symptoms we saw were, were respiratory symptoms. And so that included things like um, cough, um, um kind of an irritation of the, the airway. Cough would be the mo most common one in terms of a, um, an acute respiratory symptom. Um, nasal irritation is, is also pretty common um, and uh, irritation of, of the eyes. So, so those, uh, those, those are all uh, symptoms that are relatively, uh, that, that they're, not, they're certainly not unique to, to exposures in the cannabis workplace. Anyone that has seasonal allergies um, would, would um, experience one or more of, of, uh, of those kinds of symptoms. Um, and so uh, when, when we ask workers about uh, those particular symptoms, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we ask, do those symptoms get worse when you're at work? Do they get better when you're away from work? Are there specific activities that you do at work that make those symptoms worse? And that's to, to try and um, uh, ensure that what we're looking at is um, uh, 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 symptoms that are associated with work activities and not just generic um, seasonal allergies or influenza or, or, or common cold type symptoms, anything like that. Uh, we do, we, in our earlier studies, we, we also asked about uh, dermal symptoms because some workers do, uh, do report um, getting um, an irritation of the, of the skin associated with exposure to, to cannabis. That was less, less prevalent than the respiratory symptoms, but, um, but it was still reported by something on the order of, I think, 40% or so of the, um, the workers that the small group of workers that we interview. Yeah, I I would fall into that category, but I'm also one of those people that I I have an intense thought and I might get hives. So it's <laughs> not unique. Um, so I am kind of curious though too. You know, uh, folks who work in cannabis tend to also consume cannabis. One of the common ways of consumption is inhalation, which yeah. can cause irritation. Do you are you controlling for that as well in your study at all, or has has that become an issue in your inquiry? Yes. So absolutely. That's a, that's an excellent question. So that first study that we did of about 20 cannabis workers, I think 19 out of 20 used cannabis um, one way or another. And I think most of the, those people smoked cannabis, perhaps in addition to, to, um, to using edibles. Um, so, uh, I explained with the symptom side of things, we we um, we asked those questions focused specifically around if they get worse at work. Presumably, um, people that are using cannabis are using it on the on the weekend as well, um, and so that um, if the symptoms were only due to their personal use, then then we wouldn't see those symptoms getting worse at work, and that would not be characterized in our study as a work-related symptom. Uh, we, we, uh, we did try and uh, control for uh, cannabis use. And the way we did that was we uh, recruited 40 other study participants, 20 of whom um, used cannabis, but were not exposed to it occupationally, and 20 of whom did not use cannabis and, and did not work with cannabis. And we looked at the, and we for, for those two control populations, we um, collected respiratory symptom data and we measured lung function and airway inflammation. 
And uh, and what we tended to see was that uh, for the control population that didn't use cannabis and was not occupationally exposed to cannabis, they had the lowest reported the lowest level of rep respiratory symptoms, and um, and their lung function and airway inflammation uh, was uh, was kind of within the the U.S. normal range for. Um, well, the people that used cannabis but didn't work with it, uh, they had somewhat more symptoms than than that first group that didn't use and didn't didn't work with cannabis. Um, and I think they had slightly lower lung function, if I remember right. And then the cannabis workers were a little bit more impaired than the cannabis user group. And so the uh, the the conclusion from that particular study was that uh, that smoking cannabis did seem to result in respiratory symptoms, um, airway inflammation, um, decrement in lung function, but being occupationally exposed to cannabis had an effect above and beyond what was seen if uh, if you just used cannabis. Okay. Um, we hope in this in the uh, the larger study that we're embarking on now that we will be able to recruit for enough workers that a portion of that the workforce population uh, will be exposed to to cannabis but won't actually be cannabis users and that will give us a more direct control for, um, for uh, or a way to control for personal use characteristics. Okay. Fantastic. Um, we're wrapping up. I kind of have just one other um, big question for you. Um, I saw Dr. Sack coming in too. Um, I don't know if uh, you want to add anything in here, but um, are you going to be proposing any solutions uh, as a part of this process? Absolutely. Yeah. So um, it wouldn't be particularly helpful work if we just point to a problem and, and leave the industry to deal with it. Uh, so, so um uh one of the things that we are uh, doing is trying to identify um appropriate uh, economic economically feasible practical solutions that um uh, that employers could implement to reduce exposures um one of the the uh, parts of the process that um, we suspect as a significant source of dust exposure is the the knock box or the the rocket box system that is used for um, for filling the the pre roll joints, and that seems to be a um, a part of that the process that um, for those facilities that are using that kind of device is amenable to exposure control because one could put a an enclosure over the top of it um, um, and then. Uh, exhaust the, the the air from that that process through a filter to reduce the workers exposure uh, so we already have a couple of workplaces that uh, we are um, starting to work with on that uh, that kind of an intervention um, and in fact this is kind of a great example of a partnership where those workplaces had already themselves decided that hey this is we think this is a problem for our workers uh, we're starting we're trying to build our own enclosures to um, to to reduce the exposure, and and where we're coming in as as kind of partnering with those those workplaces, testing uh, the exposures with and without the um, the um, enclosure in place, uh, helping to modify the enclosure to to make it more effective. Um, and then the the idea would be that we can demonstrate the effectiveness of, of that. Uh, intervention um, uh, to to employers uh, so that they would then be able to implement it themselves. And it'll be a, a relatively low cost intervention. I think that the equipment we're looking at it at the moment, maybe all together, comes to two or three hundred dollars. So we're not we're not talking about a ten thousand dollar piece of equipment that um, that really would be unaffordable for for most employers. Uh, before we close, I did want to introduce uh, Dr. Cora Sack, who joined who, who joined the conversation. So, um, Dr. Sack is a physician here at the uh, respiratory health physician here at the University of Washington, 
an occupational medicine physician, um, and uh, she is is leading up the uh, the health component of the study. Thanks, Chris, and I really apologize. I, I was actually in clinic seeing patients, so that's why I was uh, I joined so late. Um, and I, I didn't hear the full discussion of kind of what we found um, in the uh, preliminary studies. Um, but if there are any specific questions I can answer, please let me know. And um, I'm really excited and, and looking forward to doing this next phase. Awesome. Uh, thank you. I think, um, I suppose just question wise, are there, um, in particular, this is going out to folks. I did have another follow-up question. If somebody is an employee at a facility, um, could they re and, you know, and want to bring this to their employer? Is that, is that an option? And if they did that, could, um, we obviously, I want to let everybody know, you can reach out to us here, email at the cannabis alliance.us. Um, and we'll share that information and, and help get you connected, uh, here. Um, and like I said, if an employee is interested, is that something that they kind of need to work through their employer? Is there, I'm sure we can share some resources. Um, yeah, and to, that's a great question. And do you mean if the employee is interested in being part of um, the study or if they're having any particular health symptoms they think are related to work? I suppose either one of those questions yeah. to hear the answer to. <laughs> yeah, I think talking with their employer, if they're interested in, in being part of the study and um, seeing if that would be something that employer is interested in. Um, and certainly if they're having symptoms they're concerned are related to work, um, you know, reaching out to their personal physician or, um, or an occupational medicine physician that, um, and we'd be happy to share um, our contact information um, at the University of Washington, our occupational medicine cl um, clinic, if people had specific concerns um, to try to help sort those out and, and figure out what's going on. That's a, a great question. Fantastic. Sorry, I'm clicking through the, the questions here. Um, I think then too, um, along those lines, if somebody is um, sort of experienced, like, are there things that you would like employees to know or employers to know um, as we work on the science part of things, just sort of precautions that folks should be paying attention to and considering um, while we're waiting for more complete information to come? Yeah, and another very good question. Um, you know, I think that um, just to be aware that that there is a high index of concern that there are um, some inhalational exposures at these workplaces that can result in health symptoms. So that if they are experiencing symptoms, they should keep them, they should take them seriously and not just pass them off. Um, uh, and in particular, again, that, that our concern is that um, potentially um, some of the, the dusts and, and contact with the plant may be um, responsible for some of um, for some of these symptoms. So, so being aware aware of that is, is important, I think. I don't know, Chris, do you have any other things you would add to that? No, that's exactly what, what I was going to say, that um, as a worker, if you are experiencing respiratory symptoms and you feel that those symptoms are, um, are made worse when you're at work or that they happen when you're at work but not outside of work, um, then that would be important information to share with your um, personal uh, physician uh, so that the physician can do an appropriate uh, work up to, um, to determine um, your respiratory health. Uh, they, uh, they, they may uh, prescribe you uh, appropriate um, medication if, if you're having allergic type symptoms. Um, and as, as uh, Dr. Sack indicated, um, if, uh, if, the, if they need to refer to an occupational medicine specialist, um, the clinic at the, at the University of Washington can help out from that perspective.
Wonderful. Um, we are at the hour. I want to thank you both so much for your time um, and for the explanation of all of that. We're getting comments uh, on Facebook of folks saying thank you so much. It's really important information. Um, so we do really look forward to this uh, project continuing to develop. Um, the number one thing we say all the time in the cannabis industry is the thing we need the most is more research, <laughs> better understanding of what is happening uh, with this plant and uh, all of the industry around it as well. So thank you also, especially in a time when it was not common for people to consider that cannabis needs to be studied, even as adult use came online. Um, thank you for leading the way uh, in doing this research as well. Um, so again, uh, if anybody is interested in participating or would like some more information you can reach out uh, to us, email at thecannabisalliance.us. Uh, we've got a bunch of great information and can put you all in contact. Um, my name is Caitlin Ryan. I think I forgot to say that at the beginning. I was excited to get into the thick of the information here. Um, and here at the Cannabis Alliance, we are dedicated to the advancement of a vital, ethical, equitable, and sustainable cannabis industry. And this work is firmly in the, the heart of that mission statement. Um, so uh, look forward to, like I said, hearing more. I hope you all have a great rest of your day here on a Wednesday. Thank you.